Good afternoon. A very warm welcome to all of you both here present at CTU and those who join us remotely. Welcome to Sundays at CTU. And thank you for choosing to spend part of the St. Patrick's Day with us. I'm Sister Barbara Reed, President of Catholic Theological Union. For 20 years, for over 20 years, CTU has offered Sundays at CTU <coughs> series, which features the celebration of Eucharist led by one of CTU's participating men's religious communities, followed by a lecture on a contemporary topic in the Catholic Church. Today, I am pleased to welcome Father Giovanni Di Soto, who is provincial of the missionaries of St. Charles, St. John the Baptist province, more familiarly known as the Scalabrinians. Father Giovanni will preside at Eucharist, and Father John Carchi, Rector, President, and Associate Professor of Biblical Studies at Mundelein Seminary, will deliver the annual Barry Rankin Lecture on God's Creation. Today's program is the fifth annual Dr. Barry Rankin Sundays at CTU Lecture Series on God's Creation. The Dr. Barry Rankin Series on God's Creation was established in 2020 to permanently remember the scholarship and contribution of the late Dr. Barry Rankin, a key founder of Catholic Theological Union. In 1968, at the time when CTU's three founding men's religious communities were considering an innovative joint venture of a new collaborative school of theology in the heart of Chicago, Barry Rankin was then a member of the Passionist community and a leader among the theology faculty. His courageous voice helped propel the project from a daring dream inspired by the spirit of Vatican II into a reality that was born in the Hyde Park University neighborhood of Chicago. Barry was a key member of the charter faculty of the new school, helping to shape its curriculum and guide its beginning years. Following his priestly ministry, he took up work with the federal government. Barry, together with his wife Donna, were generous supporters of CTU, and Donna continues to be, and they have been faithful participants in our programs. We are truly grateful for their gift to underwrite an annual Dr. Barry Rankin Sundays at CTU lecture series on God's creation. And now we will begin our Eucharistic liturgy and Father Giovanni Di Soto will be our presider. The darkness that surrounds 
Once again, as we gather for this liturgy, as a God's family, thus for loving God to continue pouring His grace upon all of us and bless us in the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to reminds, reminds us this time is coming to continue His mission, bidding to the Father to give His life for our salvation. Be with you all. We celebrate today the fifth Sunday of Lent. We celebrate St. Patrick, my good Italian. I just came from two wonderful St. Joseph table. <laughs> and uh, with all the intercession of all the good saints of offering us from heaven with Mary, let us continue celebrating who we are, God's people. And we just look into the Echo theology, valuing creation. And I like the expression that this says, to see everything is subject, not object. So as we come together as subjects, God's people, creatures of God, along with all creation, we ask God to continue touching, renewing our heart, to be able to be faithful to the gift of creation to give to one another for all those time we fail to care for motherland to care for brothers and sisters for all the creatures recognizing our sinfulness we ask God to cleanse us purify us as the repentant heart we sing Lord Jesus you are living water, Christ Jesus, you are light in our darkness, Christ on all of us, forgive us all our sins, and bring all of us to life and joy everlasting. Amen. And let us pray. <laughs> By your help, we beseech you, Lord our God, may we walk eagerly in that same charity with which, out of love for the world, your son ended himself over to death. We ask this to our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers, the day I took them by the hand to lead them forth from the land of Egypt. For they broke my covenant. And I had to show myself their master, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will place my law within them and write it <coughs> upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer will they have need to read to teach their friends 
and relatives how to know the Lord. All, from the least to the greatest, shall know me, says the Lord. For I will forgive their evil doing <coughs> and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
reading from the letter to the Hebrews. In the days when Christ Jesus was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Bethsaida in Galilee, and he asked him, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me and where I am there also will my servant be the father will honor whoever serves me I am troubled now yet what shall I say father save me from this hour but it was for this purpose that I came to this hour father Glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that heard it said it was a thunder. But others said, An angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, This voice they not come for my sake, but for yours. Now is the time of judgment on this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this, indicating the kind of death he would die. And my brothers and sisters, 
This is the good news, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm very, decided, very excited, delighted to leave the pulpit to Dr. Barber. <laughs> As I look around the room, I can see that some of us are old enough to remember when the soul song, I'm going to make you love me, soared to the top of the charts when Diana Ross and the Supremes, along with the Temptations, recorded it in 1969. I see at least a few faces <laughs> that are lighting up and you remember the song. In the song, the smitten lover lists all the ways he's going to win over the woman that he's fallen for. He's going to sacrifice for her, shower her with love and affection, use every trick in the book to get her hooked. I'm going to make you love me. But we don't find out if he succeeded. <laughs> There's something of the same dynamic in today's scripture readings. God, speaking through Jeremiah, to Israel says, in effect, I'm going to make you love me. I tried showering you with love, God says, with the covenant that I made with your ancestors, taking them by the hand and leading them forth from the land of Egypt. But they broke that covenant. Written on tablets of clay, they were easily smashed. I'll try again. I'm going to make you love me. This time, I'll write it on your hearts. Like those little heart-shaped candies on Valentine's Day, your hearts will be inscribed with, I'm yours. But there's a glitch. No one, not even God, can force us to love back. And just as God's declaration of love on clay tablets could be smashed, so too hearts can be broken when love offered is rejected. Our broken-hearted God then tries one more way to hook the people of God that God so loved. I'm going to show how much I love you by becoming one of you. But this is a risky venture. Humans can still choose to love God back or not. And if Jesus becomes fully human, then he can choose or not to love God back in the way God hopes he will. Both the reading from Hebrews and the Gospel today allude to the most intense moment of choice that Jesus faced, the final moment before his arrest in Gethsemane, when, as Hebrews says, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who is able to save him from death. The gospel, as is typical of the fourth evangelist, downplays Jesus' Jesus's struggle with a much more mild, I am troubled now, yet what should I say? Save me from this hour? Hebrews says Jesus learned obedience from what he suffered. The word obedience has as its root the need to listen, to hear God's voice, God's declaration of love, and to follow where it leads. In his moments of suffering, Jesus listens all the more intently as he discerns what is the faithful choice to fulfill his mission to reveal God's love. And he shows us how to do likewise to listen and love back. God's love comes to us in human flesh, but humans keep on choosing to reject that love, choose to do evil, and inflict suffering on one another. Having chosen to be one with us, Jesus suffers and dies, as all of us must. But the offer of divine love does not die with him. 
The gospel gives us a vivid image for how death is transformed into new life. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Now science tells us that when seeds are buried in the ground, there are two possibilities. They either break through their husk and stretch into the fruit-bearing plant they are able to become, or they die. A seed that dies produces no fruit. The seeds that stay alive and that are nurtured with the right amount of water, light, air, and nutrients are the ones that are transformed into fruit-bearing plants. The seed that is transformed and bears much fruit has indeed died. It has died to being a seed, leaving aside its protective husk. But the life is still in it. Life that must be changed through a process of greening so that it can produce more seeds, more life. As we come close to the end of this year's Lenten journey, God says to us all the more intensely, I'm going to make you love me, knowing full well it's up to us whether God will succeed this time or not. Let us in your faith as we say, I believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and made, conscious of the Father. To him all things to him, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and he came back. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is the glory and glory of life, who has spoken to the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism of the forgiveness of sins. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, God our Father, has shown his immense love for all of us. And so, with confidence, we turn to the Lord in prayer. and our Bishop Blaise, that they may continue to proclaim the merciful love of God. We pray to the Lord. For peace in our world, especially in Ukraine, 
Ukraine and Russia, in Palestine and Israel, and in Haiti, that all will turn from hatred to love and from violence to reconciliation. We pray to the Lord. this Easter, that the seeds of the gospel buried deep within them may yield a rich harvest of prayer, <coughs> faith, and service. We pray to the celebration of Easter with hearts and minds renewed. that they may know the gentle touch of God's healing love. We pray to the Lord. to the merciful love of God. We pray to the Lord. For all the souls in purgatory, that they may finally receive their heavenly reward. We pray to the Lord. For all the intentions deep within our hearts. in our hearts the hope of eternal life. Bring us and all our loved ones to the joy of the kingdom of heaven. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen.
And let us pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice may be pleased, acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Hear us, Almighty God, and having instilled in your servants the teaching of the Christian faith, graciously. Purify them by the working of this sacrifice. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right, really right and just. Our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for your will that our self-denial should give you thanks, humble our sinful pride, contribute to the feeding of the poor, and so help us imitate you in your kindness. And so we glorify you with countless angels as with one voice of praise we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fountain of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them light that do fall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time Jesus was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread. Giving thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. St. Greek went up to Jerusalem and said, We want to see Jesus. Here he is. Our Lord and Savior, our friend, our joy in life.
in a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, a drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of a new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. And here is Jesus says, my, my hour has come to give my blood for all of you, for your salvation to eternal life. Let us proclaim what we believe that here is present Jesus, the mystery of our life. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of Jesus' death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life, the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church, your missionary church, spread throughout the world, bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Blaise, Archbishop, and all the ministers of your church. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection. For all who have died in your mercy, we remember Mary Rankin, all the victims of violence, war, all the members of the CTU family who have gone to eternal life, may God glorify all of them and give us his consolation. Have mercy on all of us, we pray, on our particular intentions. And with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the Blessed Joseph, his spouse, with the Blessed St. Patrick, all our founder saints, the different communities, all our patrons, all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages. We may marry to be coerced to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him. O God Almighty, Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Treasuring us love and allowing ourselves always to enjoy his love in our lives as we journey in this Lenten season toward the mystery of salvation, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and bring us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days 
that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin, safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus Christ, to say to your apostles, to us here present today, those accompanying from home, peace, I leave you. My peace I give you. Look not on our saints, on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. We live and reign forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of Jesus, our life, love, and salvation, be with you all. Thank you. Let's continue treasuring the love of peace of Christ that we say hi to those around us and peace to all. Bread of salvation, cup of forgiveness, And behold, this is Jesus, our Lord and Savior. He is the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are you and I called to the supper of the Lamb.
And let us pray. We pray, Almighty God, that we may always be counted among the members of Christ in whose body and blood we have communion, lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. And certainly before the final blessing, I would like to take this opportunity. Thank you, Sister Barbara, for the wonderful homily. And we can continue treasuring, as you said, in the new covenant, the love of God in our life as we continue journey. Jesus Calabrinian, thanks for inviting me to preside this liturgy. I'm also I'm very happy that a few years ago we finally returned to CTU as we start uh, a new experience, a uh, uh, theological study in pastoral context. We have pre presently three students here from three different countries, so we are very delighted for them to be here and we want to certainly continue pushing for those pastor experience and here at CTU I'm very delighted we are here. So to all those who are company from home, to all of you who are here, part of the CTU family from staff, a member, friend, trustee, and students. So thanks for the opportunity to share and may God continue helping us, wonderful choir, to move on with faith and hope in the journey of our life. The Lord be with you. Bless, O Lord, your people, for long for the gifts of your mercy, a grant the what? At your prompting they desire, they may receive by your generous gift. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may our loving God and power bless you all, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for coming. Uh, enjoying the lecture from the good doctor back there. I guess so, right? And so keep uh, going on. Let us go in the love of God we have celebrated.
Welcome back. It is my great pleasure to introduce Father John Karchi. Father Karchi was appointed Rector President of the University of St. Mary of the Lake Mundelein Seminary in 2015. He's a native of East Chicago, Indiana, and was ordained a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago in 2002. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Mathematics and a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics in 1987 from the University of Chicago. He also holds two earned doctorates, a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of Chicago, and a doctorate in sacred theology from the Catholic University of America's Department of Biblical Studies. We are so pleased to welcome you this afternoon for uh, this uh, Barry Rankin Lecture on Creation Series. Father Karchi. Thank you, and uh, I can't think of a more wonderful uh, homily in preparation for this talk than the one you just graced us with, Sister Barbara. I can't help but think that if the opportunity had existed, God would have made Hosea go to Motown, because I, I think they'd be a, a perfect blend. But to think about that refrain, right? I'm going to make you love me, um, and just how that sort of reverberated through, through the years. Really, to come here uh, is very special for me on, on just a whole number of ways. I spent the many formative years of my life just on the street at Cornell when I was at the UFC, uh, as we called it then. But Barry Rankin you know, really uh, spent his last years at Northwestern University, where I was serving as chaplain. Uh, he and Donna were there. And I have to confess, I had no idea of his involvement with CTU. He was fairly soft-spoken, at least when he was there. Donna was a little more lively, uh, as she is. Uh, but I just had no idea, and uh, I wish I had known. I would have picked his brain, uh, as I've since learned how instrumental he was in, in the founding of this place. So for that reason, it's really very special for me to be here in the lecture series that's named after him. Uh, Special in another way, and I'm delighted to see that she's here, because the title comes from uh, a conversation in an early chapter of one of her first books by one of CTU's most illustrious alumni, uh, Beth Kenobi. And you can talk to her about the full backstory to echo theology. I just remember talking with her a little bit shortly after her first book was published, where that word turns up. And I don't remember the conversation we had at all. I just remember the expression, echo theology. And I thought, what a very cool idea. I don't know what that means exactly, but it must mean something. And so now, 15 years later, whatever it is, um, when I was graciously invited to, to share some thoughts, it just occurred to me this was the time to really decide what that phrase meant. Uh, and the last thing I'll just say why this is so special for me is because the idea kind of behind it, just the kind of nascent thoughts I'll share with you, really have their roots, I hate to say it, over 40 years ago, when I, as an 18-year-old college kid, was sitting barely a mile away from here in a lecture hall, a class at the UFC called Greek Thought, if that isn't vague enough. But it was my introduction to the pre-Socratics, right? Heraclitus and Pythagoras and others. And we'd gotten to this idea of logos, the logos. This idea that you know, there's this sort of overarching, definitive, whatever you want to call it, structure in the universe, this sort of mind thought that is ordering everything that we see, you know, a cosmic order. Um, and I loved science at the time. And to just even get the vague idea that anyone had ever thought of such a thing as logos, I was so taken up with the idea. And then it was on the very last day of the class, almost as just an afterthought, the professor said, oh, and you know, uh, the Gospel of John kind of picks up with this idea, and da 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 And that hit me like a ton of bricks, because it had never even remotely, I didn't know Greek, uh, that in the beginning was the word, and the word, the word, in the prologue of John, that, okay, it has different meaning, perhaps, but it very much is drawing on that idea. 
And it's almost like overnight, my faith that I had grown up with since childhood became interesting to me. You know, I'm not proud to say that, but it's just how it is, right? All of a sudden, you're so taken with an idea from a totally other area, and then all of a sudden, it gets connected with this thing that you've just been immersed in since childhood. So the coming together of, of Barry Rankin and a wonderful idea introduced by Beth Kenobi, and this place where the idea of a word sort of ordering the entire world around us uh, might be a possibility is what makes this really a joyful uh, time that we'll spend together. And uh, I promise you, uh, the ghost of my German father will not let us go one minute over the scheduled time. So <laughs> wherever we're at at 4.45, uh, we'll call it. We'll go into Q&A. We won't call it this early. It was on, it was on the ah, OK. Of course. All right, thank you. So just to start with the idea of what is an echo, OK? Um, again, wonderful story of echo, the Greek myth, uh, mythology. But really simply put, you need four things. Nothing earth shattering there. You, you need a source, but you also need a receiver, right? Uh, Sister Barbara was talking to us about God's not going to force us to love him. That invitation goes out, but it has to be received. And that's one of the beautiful things about our God. You know, the invitation is there, but will you accept it? But then here's a real key point. If you want to have an echo, you need a boundary, okay? Or a limit, for lack of a better term. This is such a key idea through all of modern science and I would argue it's a key idea in any relationship. This idea of sound can go forth, but you're never going to hear an echo unless it actually comes back at you. And that means it has to bounce off of something. Now, nothing ever just simply bounces back at you. When it encounters whatever the barrier is, some of it gets absorbed, some of it gets broken or refracted, if you want to use that term. Some of it comes back. Now, you don't often hear an echo in a room or in your house, right? Well, a couple of reasons for that. One is that that sound wave often does get broken up by the stuff that's in the room. So carpet tends to be a pretty good absorber. Human skin, thank you very much. You're saving us all from having our ears pounded by incessant echoes. But there's another reason that you may not always think of. And that has to do with time or distance. Because when we make a noise, or a noise is made near us, that stays with us as an immediate sensation for about one-tenth of a second, which is a little bit longer than you might think. And so let's just say you were pretty close to a wall, and you yelled out or whatever. It would come back to you much sooner than a tenth of a second. And so you would not perceive it. You would just receive it all as one continuous sound. So if you actually want to hear an echo, you've got to be far enough away that that much time will elapse between you sending the sound out and it coming back to you. Now, sound travels pretty darn fast. So it's unlikely you're going to be in a room that's large enough for an echo to happen. OK, enough of the physics lecture. My point is, if you want to stay with the metaphor, this idea of receiving Right? If, if you've sent out wisdom, if you've sent out a thought, if God sent out God's word, to receive it and receive it well does take time. It does take distance. And time and distance, in some sense, are interchangeable concepts. So you put all these together, and you get an echo. So what about echo theology, then? And, um, Beth gets no discredit for this. As she talks about it, it makes a lot of sense. This is thinking in the shower, you know, last week or something. <laughs> Not singing in the shower, no echoes there. But so the source, you know, let's think of it as the word of God. Obviously, that's so central to our tradition. You see it in Genesis, then John does pick it up in the prologue of his gospel, but all the prophets, the word of the Lord came to, you know, and you fill in the name. This anthropomorphization of God's word, um, but has to be received, right? So initially, 
in some sense, received by creation itself. And it's kind of this chicken and egg. It's the word, well, if we really want to be sticklers, it is received by a pre-existent. It's received by this chaos. God's word goes into the chaos. Now, I'm with diocesan seminarians, so if they hear anything that makes Thomas Aquinas nervous, we can't say it. So I'm not going to worry too much about pre-existent chaos, but it's there, you know, at least in Genesis 1. And so the word goes out, if you want to think of it to that degree, and it's received. And certainly once creation starts getting going, then that gets received by the subsequent words of God. But of course, things really get interesting only once you have people, right? Human beings to receive that message. And then as Barbara said so beautifully, sometimes that word is well received and sometimes not. And think of prophet after prophet after prophet. Think of the judges, right? The Israelites under the judges. Oh, they receive, they're doing so great and then not so good. Uh, receiving, rejecting, receiving, rejecting. Uh, but if there's not an authentic reception, um, the echo is going to suffer or be non-existent. And then limits or boundaries. And I just invite us to think about, especially when we get to talking about the eco-theology, uh, it's the finitude. It's the finitude of creation itself. Basically, you have God and then you have finitude. That which is created is going to be limited whether that's a person, you know, or an animal, or a planet, um, those are necessary limitations. To be not God means to have limits to some degree. And then what's time or distance? Well, it's just time itself. It's the unfolding of God's desire that, you know, as Paul says in Ephesians, we will become adopted sons and daughters. And how does all that play out? So I, I realize you guys aren't going to be able to see it all the way in the back, but the beginning of Psalm 19, at least for me, captures this beautifully. Uh, Psalm 1-9. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament proclaims the works of his hands. Day unto day pours forth speech. Night unto night whispers knowledge. So notice all these words of speaking, the language of speaking. Um, but they're the heavens that are declaring. It's the firmament that's proclaiming. Day that's pouring forth speech. And then the psalmist is no fool. So she or he says, there is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. In other words, you don't need to have speech as we know it. Creation itself is articulating these ideas, right? And so. It isn't only in Genesis 1 that you can get this proclamation. But in some sense, all this subsequent proclamation is the echo of that first proclamation. That's why we don't need Genesis 1 every couple books of the Bible. You know, what we get there from the beginning is what we need. And then from there, that word continues to reverberate. And God, of course, can continue to speak God's word, but you don't recreate the way you did in Genesis 1, and that once that creation has happened, it has its own capacity for proclaiming and sending out to be received or not received. A report goes forth through all the earth, their messages to the ends of the world. Whose messages? Well, creation's message itself. He has pitched in them a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom from his canopy. And like a hero, joyfully runs its course. Notice the sense of limits or boundaries here. Not talked about explicitly, but they're there. Uh, day unto day, night unto night. Well, day bounds night and night bounds day. Um, this beautiful metaphor, right? Pitch a tent uh, for the sun. Bridegroom coming forth from his canopy. Well, that's a structure, that's a place. The bridegroom's hanging out somewhere and he's going somewhere, joyfully runs its course, right? There's some direction, there's a start, and presumably there's a finish. From one end of the heavens, it comes forth. Its course runs through to the other. This is a bounded, beautiful entity. 
And if you don't have those boundaries, you're never going to get it. You're just going to send it out forever into the abyss. The only way astronomers ever learn anything is because stuff bounces back. And that's pretty much the only reason any of us ever learn anything. If you read a book on a page, if you talk to someone, if you see something, we're only detecting it. We're only interacting with it because sound waves are bouncing off the person. Photons are bouncing off the person. Boy, isn't that romantic, right? Put that on your little candy heart. Your photons speak to me. But that doesn't change the fact that that is how we know anything, right? This idea of an echo is really at the very core of, of modern science and even not so modern science. The other thing about echo is that they're wonderfully creative. And what I mean by that is if you send a wave off and it bounces off the boundary and it comes back, it starts to interact with the original wave that went out. And if it bends or, or refracts at a boundary or something, it, it gets messy. And you see this in your, your bathtub, for that matter, splash around a little bit. You can see how all the waves start interacting. Um, but that's creation. And it'd be a whole other talk. We're not going to go into it. But this literally is the way we think about particles today, subatomic particles, that it's all vibration. They're all waves that interact with each other. Um, I think some of you know, I don't know if she's an alum from here, but uh, Heidi, remember her name, I know uh, she teaches at Loyola now. But never mind, that's not helpful. But did a wonderful work on uh, Karl Rahner and, and modern physics. And it's a, a book I'd highly recommend, and I'll think of it. So complex systems, again, is another term that gets used a lot today for the analysts, analysis of, of any number of things, not just science the way we might normally think of it. So what I showed you there is a picture of the, you know, the hub model for the airlines. And I'm sure you can recognize your most annoying city where you have to sit for a while. But this is a great example of, you'll hear a lot about complexity these days, or complexity theory. Um, and this is something that things like echoes make possible. And again, I'm inviting us not simply to think about you know, complex systems, but what does this look like as the word of God goes out, echoes, interacts with, creates? Well, to have a complex system, you just need some things or agents, like airplanes. You know, or water molecules, or words that are spoken, right? People who are interacting. You also need a means of interaction. We don't often give this thought, but if there's no interacting, then it doesn't matter how many you know, agents you have. Think of how many wonderful words of prophecy go out, and it might as well just fly right over the heads of the Israelites, or the apostles, or whomever. For me at my prayer yesterday morning, you know, it's just that message can constantly be going out, but if it isn't received, and to be received means there's interacting, there's bumping, there's friction. Things that we can often point to as not terribly desirable, but in point of fact, if we think about the things that are terribly desirable to us, we would recognize that is the fruit of interaction. And if you've earned that candy heart that someone gives you, you know, authentically, you know that it's come at a price. Uh, a price oftentimes we willingly pay, but mature love is the result of a lot of interacting. But then you need feedback, okay? This is really key too, again, key in relationships, key in on-the-job learning, but there has to be some means by which the system can let the agents know, hey, what's going on, you know, how we doing? Uh, is this whole thing working out? Now, we might normally think of that in terms of you know, some person giving you feedback, but this just happens with inanimate objects as well. Um, let's say you've got a bunch of water and you're just running it down a hill. Well, there's a reason why those grooves get formed into the hill over time, because initially, one track was a little bit easier for the water to flow through, and the feedback is then the next stream of water, it's easier for it to go in that path, and so on and so forth. So feedback can be a very general thing, but the point is the system needs to have some way of communicating back to itself. 
And think about this in the spiritual life, right? The importance of being reflective, self-reflective, but to also have the humility to seek out others for spiritual direction, to go before the Lord in prayer. Feedback is always a necessary piece if there's going to be any development of the system. And then the last thing you need are limited resources. Now we're back to limits again. And this is so important because if, if resources are unlimited, then you don't really need oftentimes a lot of interaction or a lot of feedback. You know, if, if you just wasted all your money, a prodigal son, okay, let's take the, the second prodigal son. He has an unlimited source, right? He has a, a fund from his childhood that's been set up. Well, it doesn't matter. He squanders, you know, one week's worth. The next week he gets a new deposit in his bank account. Now, that can sound cute, but just think about it for a minute. If the prodigal son was not up against scarce resources, there'd be no story, you know? And almost every time we've ever sought forgiveness or felt that, boy, we've really done something awful, uh, it's because these are precious resources, whether that's trust or whether that's some material resource. And if you put all these things together, what you begin to get is the emergence of patterns, okay? Um, where structure suddenly begins to come to light where seemingly there had been nothing before. I guarantee you this, Orville and Wilbur Wright never sat down and said, let's create that. <laughs> that is the product of a lot of people doing common sense things. I want to go from A to B, so I'll get my plane and I'll fly to A to B. And then I want to get to C, so I'll find someone to fly me to C. And pretty quickly, that becomes an unworkable mess, right? There just aren't that many planes. You can't make that run efficiently. And so the hub-and-spoke model actually birthed itself, quote-unquote, out of this complex messiness of just using these kinds of things. You know, traffic controllers getting feedback, working with the limited resources of planes and so forth, and then that grows. Why do we have, you know, recycling? Similar kinds of ideas. The myth of unlimited resources, right? For how long did people say, oh, petroleum, unlimited, got as much as we want. I believe it's in the billions, the numbers of bottles that get created. And eventually you do get feedback, you know, stuff like that, ugly, hideous, toxic. Well, what are we gonna do about it? You know, so the concept of recycling on large scales, being born of a need that comes up. And a lot of times we live in the myth of a limitless world, right? That there are infinite sources of carbon or oil. We know that's not the case today, but go back 100, 150 years. And the way people would talk about, no, there's as much as we'll ever need. And so then you get usage that feeds the usage. But if there's a source, now the myth is that there's an infinite sink. And by sink, I just mean, well, you can think of your kitchen sink. If I've got waste, if I have something undesirable, I just throw it down here and it magically goes away. We'll put it in this landfill and it will, we really treat it like an, a land never filled, but of course it fills. Um, and so you wind up with, you know, this sort of just horrific, right, uh, consequences for, for our planet working on the myth of a limitless world. We do similar things with carbon dioxide data. But the question then is, why do we do it? And so I would say the eco or the eco-theological interpretation is all based around the acceptance or the denial of global limits. If you deny the existence of limits, then you're living in a fantasy, but at least your fantasy is telling you there's just always going to be more. There's always going to be more. And if I have undesirable stuff, there's no limit to what I can get rid of. And basically, that's an echoless world. That's an echoless society. You are completely blinded to any sense of a signal that's coming back. And of course, that is a fantasy, you know? Maybe for a generation or two, you could sort of try to live with your head in the sand. We're certainly not there today. Well, notice how Pope Francis picks up on this in Laudato Si and other things. And he says early on, or not so early on, but 
in Laudato Si, we can ask what the great biblical narratives say about the relationship of human beings with the world. So, the primal commission, right? To till and to keep. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. Commanded him, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the garden of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. When you eat it, you shall die. A limit will come into your life that did not previously exist. The power to till is limited by the responsibility to keep. Those two verbs are important. To till it, to cultivate it, to work it, so that you may keep it, may care for it. Well, what's the original temptation, right? Not the original sin, the original temptation. You know, I always say to people, don't worry about your sins. You know, sins are relatively boring. Pay attention to your temptations, because even if you don't give in to them, they were very carefully designed to match your vulnerabilities and weaknesses. So when you have the original sin, let's finish up another minute or two, when you have the original sin, that means, and the serpent is the craftiest, most cunning of all the tempters, it must be the best so in order to accomplish this incredible goal. And what does the original temptation do? It basically gets the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, to resent the limitation on their freedom. Uh, and we know the basic story. You know, the serpent says, did God say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? If that were true, then God would have totally restricted their freedom, right? They could do anything they want. They could eat anything they want, only this one fruit they couldn't eat. Serpent says, God doesn't want you to eat anything. So A, that makes God a murderer, basically. He wants you to starve. But it's ultimately, he doesn't want you to have any freedom. And then we could say a lot more about this, but Eve starts taking the bait because she then exaggerates the limitation. You no, know, God said we can't eat it or even touch it. And God never said you can't touch it. But in Eve's mind, she's starting to think about, hey, where does God get off, you know, restricting our freedom? And then the serpent goes to town. Yeah, yeah, God knows if you, if you overstretch and you take that freedom that God is holding back from you, he's afraid. God's afraid that you'll be like God. Now you'll be a competitor. And so ultimately, the temptation gets the human beings feeling, worked up, that, hey, our freedom is being restricted, and we don't like that. And so pretty soon, that fruit is not about a piece of fruit. It's the thing that represents the restriction or the limit on the man and woman's freedom. And they're not going to stand for that, and they go after it. That's why it becomes so attractive. So the original fall, and notice how this echoes through time. Adam and Eve refused to keep the Garden of Eden. That was the original injunction. Cain refuses to be the keeper of his brother Abel. It's the same verb. Remember that one? Am I my brother's keeper? Later on, the Israelites will refuse to keep their covenant with the Lord. The same verb turns up again. This idea of, do I respond to a responsibility. And a responsibility, in some sense, is going to be a limit on the freedoms that I have. And so a key insight of Laudato Si is that the concept of integral ecology, chapter four of that cyclical, I'd highly recommend all of it, really. But that the eco-theological hermeneutic interpretation and the biblical hermeneutic, hermeneutic are one and the same. It's about limits and relationships. And he says as much in the document. Harm to both the natural and social environments is ultimately due to the same evil. The notion that there are no indisputable truths to guide our lives, and hence that human freedom is limitless. We have forgotten that man is not only a freedom which he creates for himself. Man does not create himself. He is spirit and will but also nature, limited nature. And unless you have those limits, you have no echo. You have no bouncing back, creative interfacing uh, of God's original word. Last slide. If we approach nature and the environment 
no longer speaking the language of fraternity and beauty in our relationship with the world. So we might say, no longer allowing these words to echo because they're not interacting. Our attitude will be that of masters, consumers, ruthless exploiters, unable to set limits on their immediate needs. Uh, so I lied to you, the very last slide is this one. And to consider Trinitarian love as an echo, because any time there is true love, there are boundaries, right? You, you cannot say to the beloved, I, I don't care whether you hear me or not, I'm just gonna profess this. Of course, it has to be received. We limit ourselves by the free will and choice of the beloved, right? Anyone who's ever been in love knows that. To not limit yourself by the free will of the other is not to love them, it's to totally objectify them. We were reminded at the start of Mass, right? Subject, not object. We are all subject. And so, again, I know this might, I'm, God is unlimited, God is infinite, we'll get all that out of the way. But there's a kind of beautiful limit in Trinitarian love. Every authentic relationship is bounded by the other and by their shared love. And so love echoes within and between the hearts of the lover and the beloved. And to just maybe sit with that and play with it a little bit of love between the three persons of the Trinity, which is the very source, right, of creation itself. And then to think about the words that they speak and how they echo and reverberate and how that one word from the beginning gets received or not received, right, through the millennia, through the generations. And that when that incredible manifestation of the one word which is echoing comes in the incarnation and how that gets received and how Mary receives in a way that the rest of us don't, um, there's just a lot to play with there. And it's one way, perhaps, of just thinking about the ecology that we are all a part of as, in some sense, an echo of that first creative word. Um, so my father is sweating a little bit, but we have 10 minutes uh, for some Q&A, or where's Rachel, our, our leader? Okay. Yes. Just wondering, Father, in terms of the echo theology in Laudato Si at the seminary, how does that get conveyed to the seminarians? Because I don't really think we hear it from the pulpit very much. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, they're not hearing about echo theology. Right. Um, that I can promise you. Uh, but, I mean, it is, the document is, is certainly read in some of the social justice classes and things like that. Um, you know, they will hear it uh, formally in, you know, seminars and such. But I'll be honest, I think it's, um, it's something that we try to engender as, as a passion or something to actually care about, you know, because it comes from, I can't make you care about the world. I can help have you experience, have experiences and show you and engender the sense of, well, why does this matter? And that means you've got to go out and experience it to some degree. Um, and so, but do we actually have, you know, here's how to give a homily on this or something like that. Uh, I won't speak for a homiletics professor, but they do hear it. If you're not hearing it from the pulpit, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So that tells you something and I appreciate the feedback. Can, can you just repeat what that question was? Yeah, how come we're not talking about uh, the ecology, you know, in, in homilies and probably beyond just homilies? Um, Father, just following up on that last question, though, it doesn't seem as though the, the, the uh, message of Laudato Si and its subsequent apostolic letter has penetrated the, the, the church in the United States. I mean, it, it just so, Cardinal Super's recently announced some steps being taken by the Archdiocese, but it just, even that just didn't get much publicity, and, it, and we hear nothing from the, we hear very little, I, I really hear nothing from the, uh, quote from the uh, uh, homilies mm -hmm. about it. It just seems like it's, it's, not, it's not seeping in, at least in this country, yeah. into yeah. the church. 
Well, and that's a broader conversation you know, than one that I can simply speak to. I think a lot of it has to do with, it's easy to ignore what you don't see. Um, and I go no farther than my friend and former colleague, Beth Kenobi, who saw to it that college students remember the trips to the dump, right? Every, um, you know, and to see it is, I think, this, just like you have to encounter Christ before you learn about it, right? And, and I'll, I'm one of the harshest critics of what often happens in seminaries, you know? Uh, we should start with encounter. If you want something like the message of Laudato Si to sink in, um, not just to experience the horrors of how things can go wrong, but also the incredible beauty, um, and that's, you know, that's not gonna come to you through social media necessarily, that may be the start of the message. Um, but that's, you know, to the degree that that's a challenging question, that's one we all have to wrestle with. Uh, because it's not as if somebody shows up at a seminary or a theologate, and then all of a sudden they're gonna have infused into them something that is radically different from the culture you know, that they knew. And that's not to let any of us off the hook, you know, least of all me, um, but that we're not hearing about it is. And then let me just say one other thing. But that also begs the question, getting the message across clearly needs to be something more than read this encyclical, right? And I think Pope Francis would be the first one to say that. It goes back to the encounter, right? So to think up ways um, so that that, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to get on a plane and travel. I mean, obviously, you don't have to go very far to encounter things locally, but dialogue, right? Talk to people whose passion and livelihood is intimately tied up with, you know, the world, the environment that we live in. Yes? Add on to some of the that it's not coming from the homil from the homily. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we come into play because that's what the the gospel said that we have to also help. It's not just the priest. And um, just to speak from the parish I'm in, we have a group that's founded by lay people because of La Gospel Sea the post encyclical called Earth Shepherds. And there's many other groups like us in the in our deanery that we work together with and spread the word and we have a Lodato Sea garden and it's, mm -hmm. they have a beautiful sign because of the archdiocese they have Lodato Sea um, leads for us and they were able to create the sign because we created the garden and our children play in that parking lot and see this and so they're going to see it every day and we keep adding things to it it's now become kind of a prayer garden too so we have the theology of it too okay. challenge for all of us that we can't just let this go that we have to um, bring this especially to our young children if you have a yeah. school yeah. and boy this I mean seminarians day they're already you know older you know, I guess the, the edge of the Millennials or but I mean Gen Z you talk to high school grade school kids today this is almost number one on their concern for the environment so I think that bodes well. I mean, it's unfortunately it has to be the top thing, but it bodes well for the attention this will continue to get. And I, I just would like to add on to that too, because at our at our parish we're also we have a Ladato Sea Garden, and we're also um, establishing a rain garden. And adding on to your point about uh, high school kids and also grade school kids, it's a it's a very key issue, you know, among our high school among our youth. And I know a different, um, you know, I was just at a climate summit a couple of weeks ago, and that, you know, it's a very primary concern of the environment. And my, my final point, um, as I was thinking through your, um, your theolo theological framework for um, eco-spirituality within the context of, of physics, if I may say it that way, um, I'm also very intrigued with what prevents us from really seeing like a ecology, ecological model, like from a biological perspective, where we really begin to see, you know, that all life is, is interconnected, that we're not operating out of, out of, out of silos, but everything is, is interconnected. So 
Um, you know, where the, how do we kind of seep that into our own consciousness so that we begin to see that what we do, what we say, life, what we teach, what we role model for our kids, everything is interconnected. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's very much where modern science is. I mean, biologists are very comfortable with that idea. Environmental scientists are very comfortable with that idea. Um, but it, it does need to get down to, you know, you shouldn't have to be a professional biologist, you know, to know that concept. I really appreciated the, um, the paradigm and the framework you, you set out in those first couple slides of sender, receiver, mm -hmm. and, and the sound waves. <clears throat> and it makes perfect sense for eco uh, theology. Um, I think it's also a very useful, uh, and maybe if you could comment a little bit about this, uh, it's very useful in our understanding both of evangelization, uh, but also enculturation. Uh, that whole notion of if the receiver is not receiving the message because it's in the wrong format or not garbled, Mm -hmm. crossing over. Uh, it's just it's an interesting way to look at the different areas of our theology. Yeah, um, and you just said it beautifully yourself. I mean, that's exactly it. I find the faith science dialogue, quote unquote, so often gets caught up in these boring corners of the room. Oh, can you prove the existence of God or not? It's the way scientists think about the world that I think is often very helpful with metaphors. Um, and oftentimes they've taken it from, you know, people thinking about God or relationships. So yeah, so enculturation, uh, for any sort of mature, loving relationship, um, if you don't listen and receive, really nothing's going to happen. Everything's going to get stalled if there's not feedback. Um, and that's as evident in the, the natural world around us as, as it is in our human, because we are part of that natural world, not surprisingly. Um, if we can't get past the just war theory, I wish we could hear more about the effect of war and atomic weapons on our environment with the ability to actually destroy it completely. Yeah. We have that capacity, which is, you know, unique in the history of this planet. I always defer to the director of development. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Father Karachi. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your wisdom with us. Can we uh, please uh, our appreciation? Thank you very much. And for those of you in uh, the room with us, we will have a reception. Uh, we have a few St. Patty's Day goodies uh, for you to enjoy. For those of you who are online, and those of you who, again, are new to CTU, please do visit our website. We have a host of resources there to stay connected, to continue the conversation that we've had today. Uh, Learn.ctu.edu is a great place uh, to look at our different uh, educational uh, opportunities, uh, but all of it is on our website at ctu.edu. And we have a number of uh, current students here, our alumni. If you're an alumni, could you just raise your hand? Welcome back home. Thank you so much for being here. We love to have our alumni here. There's many people to ask in our uh, audience here of, of uh, different opportunities to be engaged here at CTU. But again, thank you very much, Father Carci. Thank you, Father Giovanni. And uh, happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. Thank you.